Dr. Harold Malmgren and Nicholas Glinsman, co-founders and partners of Malmgren Glinsman Partners, which is a research firm fusing macro politics and geopolitics and the impacts those three areas have on financial markets. It is great to welcome both of you gentlemen to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be with you, Julia. Great to be back, Julia. Well, it's great to have both of you together. And I, what I understand about both of you is you all have a lot of fun working together. You put out incredible research, especially in a world where there's been a lot of speculation. And I know you all go really deep on the research. So it is such a treat to have you here. And um, Hal, I, I want to start with you um, since we had Nick on uh, last time. Let's start with you first, and then we'll bring Nick in. Let's start with the big picture. Let's start with the macro view today. What is the big picture for you? I want to give you as much time as you need to set the table, if you will. <clears throat> well, where, where the world is today is um, weak, weak political leaders in most countries. Lots of turbulence, lots of change, but uh, no, you know, you have to look across the world to find any leaders with strength other than Xi Jinping and Putin. <clears throat> now, I don't know Xi Jinping, but I do know Putin. I'm, I know Putin from seven years before he became president. I've written about him um, in such a way that I have not criticized him but sufficiently thorough so that if Hamlin's staff tell me he likes what I write. So, in a sense, um, we're in a, a time of actions without direction from above, and the world is so used to having some, some sense of where this is going. But second and most important right now, is the huge debt situation worldwide. <clears throat> and uh, the driver, maybe the most important, is the U.S. budget deficits, which are growing. And uh, as you know, the estimates of the deficit in the coming fiscal year that begins Monday are for a big jump upwards. And uh, Nick and I studied all those estimates, and we, our conclusion was, oh, no, it's much worse than that. Uh, that, the, um, that soon you'll see all the estimates revised that America's borrowing needs are going to be huge, absolutely huge. Uh, and that means rising interest rates, because we have to gather a lot more money but in the process, we're crowding out a lot of other borrowers. So, and uh, the end result is going to be strong dollar and lots of disruption uh, everywhere. And virtually every country is going to go through a, a kind of crisis. I would concur with that. I mean, actually, the interesting thing, Julia, is so we did a lot of work on the, the fiscal situation. I mean, you know, one glaring example, there's two glaring examples. One is defense is historically underestimated as in, for budget purposes. And actually, that's something that Harold has directly dealt with at government level. Um, and, you know, we're, we're in a situation, people are saying, Cold War II. Well, if we're in Cold War II, this budget deficit is going up. And one of the areas will be a higher defense spend. But it's not just defense, you know, and we've got all the figures that we can figure out. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, Penn Wharton budget model is showing that the spend on that is three times greater than what was put down in the latest estimate by the CBO. That's a very big budget item. So there's, there's a, you know, a lot of evidence, but the thing that we were we're worried about in terms of how does this impact the financial markets? And a lot of the conventional wisdom out there describes the US dollar as a wrecking ball. And I push back a little bit on that because the dollar reacts to relative rate differentials. 
US versus Europe versus UK versus Japan, so on and so forth, and China. And the thing that's driven the rate differentials is the US Treasury market. Okay, that is the ultimate wrecking ball. And that is why <clears throat> there was a lot of forecasts in the first half of the year where people were saying, this pace of fiscal growth, the dollar is going to collapse. Hadn't thought about the idea, well, actually, maybe the dollar doesn't collapse and strengthens to new highs in recent history on the basis that rates are going higher, as substantially higher, and that's dragging up the US. And then you have the Fed continuing to do QT, continuing to be more hawkish than the market expects. It's sort of... Um, Nirvana for anybody that's dollar bought. We we can't. We've been bearish the U.S. Treasury market since early May. Uh, we've been, I mean, really bearish. I mean, uh, early May, I think we were three thirty-five, and you know, we were sort of wow, working on our last couple of papers. And I'm sitting there going to Howard, this is going to push ten-year yields up mightily high. And, came out with a first target of 4, 470. We're almost there today, right? Which is extremely fast for that sort of move. Um, but we were also very bullish on the dollar. We have been all year on dollar against the offshore renminbi. But middle of July, there's a, a great indicator that I use, that, um, sort of the basics of which came from a city model. And I'm excellent, so I've got quite a good, at the moment I have a good relationship, I don't know whether, no, I have a good relationship. And it was just a perfect timing situation where I we actually wrote, look, you've got to be short the COSPI, you've got to be short Taiwan, i.e. some of the easier tech in the Far East. It, this was all bad for the Far East, because this was at the point where dollar MMB was dollar was beginning to accelerate against Chinese currency. Got to be short, you know, uh, the Nikkei, you have to be long the dollar against the euro and sterling. And it was just better lucky than clever. We wrote it. Uh, we didn't, those we didn't publicize because there has to be some benefit that's proprietary for the subs subscriber base. But, you know, it's been uh, a pretty good run. Long may it continue. But the thing is, things are very logical. You know, I'll call out China. You know, everybody was saying we're going to have this great bounce that has got rid of zero COVID and it's going to be the reopening bounce of, of all bounces. And I'm sitting there going, and when we're discussing this, and this is at times where behavioral economics surpasses anything to do with traditional economics. You had the biggest bubble in history, Chinese real estate popping. You've got consumers who prefer to save have just taken a massive hit to their balance sheet, the value of their real estate. Okay, they weren't going to spend and bring the, the economy out. And then in March, um, we heard of a, a speech that was given in January by Xi Jinping that was reported in March by Kyushi, which is a journal the Chinese government used to publicize Xi's speeches. Okay. This was a speech he gave in January, but they're now publicizing it in March. There's a reason. And the reason was she had dropped exports to point number three, and put the consumer on top. And this is a man that believes any fiscal, you know, he doesn't believe in helicopter money for Chinese consumers because he believes that the Chinese consumers will say it all. So there's no value in giving them helicopter. So Harold and I came and said, this is bad, bad news. It's not going to happen. The, you know, the wrong part of the economy got really hit. Double whammy. Zero COVID lockdowns. No social welfare system. And then you had this disastrous real estate situation just get worse. So, you know, there was logic at, to, to our calls, but there was also, you know, a lot of instances really talking it through with with people I'm lucky enough to know, and, and Harold doing likewise. And then I'll come, you know, so it's his, and the funny thing is, you know, this sell-off in treasury market, these higher rates, people are saying, well, you know, how much more is there going to be? The market is massively long treasury 
the treasuries from the short end to the mid curve to the long end. They're massively long, and you can see that from um, the the Bank of America. I almost called it Merrill Lynch. The Bank of America fund manager surveys. The market's long, and if you've got a market that long, then there ain't going to be much more marginal buyers. The other problem for the treasury market, as well as other governments, sovereign government markets, is global savings don't seem to be as big as they once were. So there's, there's, you know, I followed up, I let Harold go the political way, and then I followed up with what is going to happen to the markets. And, and that, that's what, where we are at the moment. And we're pretty, would I be wrong, Harold, if I said we're pretty comfortable with our current view? You know, almost everybody else is analyzing what happened last week or last month. What does it tell us about next week? We, we try to avoid that. We try to look where are we and where are we going to be three months out, six months out, a year out. Now, you have, you have to be um, confident and co courageous, but um, between us, we build confidence and we're pretty good at seeing where this is going. So, whether it's um, the dynamics in the Congress, um, we've been well ahead of what's going on there with regard to China and the rift between Congress and the White House. Um, we've been very up, you know, forward looking on what I call the hollowing out of Germany and, uh, <clears throat> and therefore the weakening and deepening weakening of Europe. So when we get to the bond markets and interest rates, I mean, we've been well ahead of the crowd, um, almost alone for a while, but without fear. I mean, we were convinced we're right and everybody else is wrong. So we're having fun. Yeah. And also, you know, from my background, one of the keys to having these views, there's two, two aspects to it. Having these views that look three, six, 12 months out, you're not necessarily with the consensus, and that's where you make much more money, right? And secondly, okay, how do you then structure these deals? You do it in two ways. One is to find, you know, it, it, if you want to do it in a leverage manner, you find uh, strategies that are cheap to put on, that don't risk huge capital. And then the other thing that you should do, which is an old Stanley Drucker Miller uh, practice, is once you realize your this trade is going your way, you, you pile it, you, you, you make it valuable okay and um you know that's what i mean you know, look i worked for one of the best traders ever alan howard and that's exactly what he used to do you know he used to put on significant size in you know a variety of option strategies and if the trade started to move you'd see the rest of the firm go in so that was effectively the way additional risk in those trades were put on so it was um that's how we do it. And, you know, we, not to toot our horns, but where clients want to talk about it, we then sit down and discuss with them. That's the whole, that's the trick. I love it. And feel free, you can toot your horn all you want on this show, and there are <laughs> no rules. You're allowed oh, to talk as I'm long as you want. I'm very shy, Julia. I'm very shy. <laughs> I don't, I don't have rules. I, at the end of the day, the show is not about me. It's about my guest, And I am loving this. I have a follow on for you gentlemen. Um, on treasuries, and you mentioned being bearish on treasuries back in May. Uh, I did see a tweet, and I want to say it was you, Nick. It may have been you, Hal, um, seeing uh, the 10 year going to five. I just want to help folks who are watching Guilty. and listening. We, we have a mix of an audience. We have folks who are actual investors and some who might be more novice. Can we extrapolate some of the consequences what? there? Should I, should I start, Hal, yeah. or do you want to? Yeah. So that was definitely me because we did a paper where we we came to the conclusion on the fiscal deficit that there were three different levels: conservative, where we thought it was going to go, which isn't that conservative, and then aggressively bigger. And we took the, the middle road, and we extrapolated and we said our first target is four seventy, but we're going to five. And actually, we think we're going north of five. What did Jamie Diamond say? 
Seven. Blog. There you go. And that's on short. So um, the consequences of that, this is it. This is where it's really interesting and the difference between continents occur, okay, as well. The the One of the consequences, let's talk about the domestic economy in the U.S., so 75% of private debt, that's households with their mortgages or corporations, are fixed rate. Okay, so the transmission mechanism is very slow. And that's, what the, that's why we haven't seen a recession. You hop over the, the pond to Europe, 75% of private debt, be it mortgages or private corporation, is floating rate. Hence, tra the transmission mechanism is way faster. So there's that. So one would anticipate dollars going higher because the economy will outperform and rates are going to go higher because the economy will outperform, bearish for the treasury market. Then you go foot to the Far East and you've got two areas that can have an impact. One is the way the dollar's rate structure has impacted positively the dollar versus the yen. And it's all relative. So rising rates in the US and so no, negative interest rate in Japan. Yes, they've been playing with the yield curve, but that's out to 10 years. Uh, why do we, you know, people are saying, oh, you know, they'll, they'll intervene at 140 or 135. They'll intervene at 140. They're, they're still waiting for the intervention at 150. Now, politically, the timetable is not good for the Bank of Japan to do it, and it's usually the Ministry of Finance. But the point is, 150, you're going to have more inflation piped into Japan. And that's why we've been calling for the end of NERP to occur in January. And the reason we've waited till January is on the basis that uh, there's likely to be a snap election of the lower house either October or November. Okay, Bank of Japan cannot make that sort of decision during an election situation. So January is probably, you know, given one of those dates, January is probably the first meet live meeting for that to go from negative rates to flat, zero, or even positive. Then you got China cutting rates. <coughs> cutting rates now. It always strikes me, you know, my wife is Brazilian, so I follow Brazil quite a bit. And the Brazilians look at their currency level. If it's weakening, you know, that's a problem for them. The only problem really, I mean, their inflation is single digit. They've, got a, they've had a very hawkish central bank. But I've noticed this characteristic where a stronger real is a macho thing to have. It's the same in China. And it's definitely been a, a characteristic, and it is syncrasy. And I'm probably going to be slaughtered for saying this, but a lot of EM countries would rather have a stronger currency than a currency that acts as an uh, escape valve. So, you know, if you think of China, a lower renminbi is good for the export sector. Okay, it, and if they keep cutting rates, well, that's that's what's going to happen. The bond market levels in China are going to be much lower. It's a, it's a great trade to have dollar renminbi right now because you've got positive carry. You don't get penalized for having that trade up because your yield is higher in the US. So every time you roll your currency position, you're getting paid to do it. Um, so the point is, if we get start moving up north of five, uh, this is where the re wrecking ball comes in. It's going to impact on the currencies. And it really will impact on the currencies. Now, some people think, Maybe the treasury and the you know maybe the treasury and the Fed won't let that go so far. Well, as soon as the Fed's an anti-inflation fight for sure, <clears throat> and um, well, the treasury is a source of very mixed policy activity. So I'll wait to comment on that a little bit later. I may even shift it over to Al, Al right now to have a go at that one. But my point is. You know, you see a lot of commentators say the dollar is the wrecking ball. You, you, dollar wrecking ball. It's not. It's the treasury market. That's the stuff that, that's where the wrecking starts. So, you know, the dollar is an instrument of the wrecking ball. <coughs> now, was that okay, Hal? Was that good? Yeah, no, I think that's right. 
Yeah, people get try to oversimplify when they say the dollar is doing it. The dollar is just a result of these changing pressures uh, <clears throat> driven by debt and the um, service of the debt. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, Europe goes down first because they're more vulnerable to changes in rates. But <clears throat> but um, looking ahead, I know there are a lot of people who think, oh, we're not going to have a recession. Um, somehow we're, we breeze through. Uh, but <clears throat> the um, when, when Jamie Dimon's worried about 7%, <clears throat> He's he's um, thinking about what he should be thinking about, which is what happens to um, regional banks in the U.S. that are locked into uh, commercial real estate. What happens to um, the big non-bank credit providers? And that includes private equity and uh, pensions, endowments, and uh, <clears throat> insurers, and they're all providing, but when they change position, they have to refinance quite often. And the refinance... Carl, you know, I heard something very interesting on the pension funds. Of course, higher rates makes it easier for them to meet their liability. Yeah, and the trouble is, when they eventually have to mark to market some stuff, <laughs> so it's a, it's a bit like this. You know, oh, we're up, back up to our, oh, well, we've managed it. Oh, got a good mark to market. I'll have to sell something. So, so it's it's both a blessing and um, and a torture, I guess. Yeah. Well, what I was leading up to is um, when all you know, private um, non-bank financing in the U.S. used to be smaller than banks. But now, non-bank financing, uh, by in many studies, uh, it's now clear that non-bank financing is much larger than the total of all banks in the U.S. <clears throat> now, when those non-bank providers of credit end up having to refinance at much higher rates, we're going to have a lot of them not, unable to do it. And we're going to have a period of uh, a credit bust, a credit contraction. We haven't hit that yet, but we will uh, probably in in the election year, and that's going to create all sorts of political consequences. I mean, the debate on budgets is going to get bigger and bigger. But but let's face it, can't do anything because nobody's going to vote for tax hikes. Nobody's going to um, want to cut spending in election year. When the, cuts, when, the, when the change comes, it'll be after the election. <clears throat> and uh, so if you really want to plan ahead, a lot of the uh, tax favors uh, that are available now probably get a tax in 2025. I'm, I'm taking a point of view, but... <laughs> I would actually add also, Julia, people were house drawing a negative economic outlook there. That doesn't mean to say rates will come down. No. Right? And, you know, if you were in a situation, one, of fiscal dominance, and two, inflation hasn't hit target, Powell is a definite, he's definitely trying to be Volcker rather than Arthur Burns. Um, we can be in a situation where, and this happened in the 60s, okay? Rates are going up in the midst of a recession because that yeah. recession was also <laughs> stagflationary. And you know one of the biggest signs of a potential stagflationary envir environment or scenario? Increasing power of trade unions. Just the best example I can give is 1970s Britain. But it was also very valid in the 1960s, both in Britain and the US. And what have we got right now? Rising profile. I mean, you know, and, and that's without wanting to sound partisan because we're not, but it was extraordinary to see Biden on the picket line yesterday 
Because the worst thing that's going to happen from an election point of view, everybody's focused on his health, but the worst thing that's going to happen is suddenly the economy rolls over because inflation's higher and the Fed's still going. Because this Fed won't stop for the election. They didn't stop in the midterms. They're not going to stop for this election. If they need to go, they'll go. So, um, it, you know, as a principle, fine. You know, absolutely. But from an economic reality point of view, you know, when you're talking about a claim 36 to 40% and the, the hard graft is on the benefits, it's not even on the 34 to, 36 to 40% wage increase, wow. I mean, that, from what I've heard, this, correct me if I'm wrong now, they're looking at a four day week. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, that, the biggest sign to me that potentially rates can go up, if, even if the economy slows down, is the growing power of the trade unions, which is, you know, the age old sign, stagflation, because that's wage push inflation. I would love to hear from both of you on stagflation. Um, I take it that you have a perspective that we're going to enter a recession. I don't know if you have a timeline there. When you mentioned stagflation, can we also expand on that? Because stagflationary environments historically are the worst for both stocks and bonds. Like, What would you do in a stagflationary environment? Me personally, I would go to um, real assets, actually. Um, you know, I, I would look at, I mean, to be honest with you, you, and it's hard to time, it's very hard to time, um, but if you can pick it, it that's when you're going to pick up great value in real estate for, you know, residential real estate. Um, so I, I'd be looking at real assets in that environment. I'm, I'm a big optimist. I th this, this will probably end up being a huge cleansing of the system and I, God, we need it. But, um, so my view is, you know, in that environment, I, I, I buy some real, uh, I try, obviously I'd try and time it, but I'd buy some real estate, but I'd probably also buy some stocks because if the stagflation gets somewhat out of control, actually stocks do quite well in that environment. If you go back in history, all the big crises, stock markets have been your same. What are the best performing, you know, Argentina stock market has saved a lot of people domestically, not from a point of view of foreigner going in and buying it because you get killed on the currency. But so that's my slightly contrary view. Bonds wouldn't touch. Wouldn't touch bonds with it. It'd be horrendous. But in the end, it will be the beginning of the next big bull market. Um, and I think you know, from a fiscal point of view, I think I think. Uh, I don't see anybody campaigning on austerity for next year's election, be it the White House or Congress, which means strikes me as pork barrel, more spending, fiscal dominance, and it will carry on. And does that delay the recession? So, yeah, oh, yeah, it could, but it will increase the inflationary mm. pressures. It makes inflationary stickier. And, you know, plus, as I said, the big warning sign in my head is the increased power of the trade unions. Not just in the US, by the way, in, in Europe as well, UK in particular, and Germany. They, but, I mean, but the UK, has, they, they've seen some big wage increases demanded. Uh, the Germans have been demanded. And, and it's interesting with the German trade unions because half of it gets hidden in annual bonuses. Okay. Still part of the package that you're going to be taxed on. So it's a wage deal. So anyway, Hal, over to you. Yeah, well, when you're talking about real assets, um, real estate comes to mind, but there are a lot of people who think, oh, I'm going to buy uh, uh, metals and uh, an agricultural commodity. Uh, those are real also. But <clears throat> um, in my view, I, I, I've spent a lot of time, <clears throat> after I left government, um, in the mid seventies, I worked with some of the world's biggest manufacturers. <clears throat> and this is not widely you known, but I would say out of the top biggest uh, dozen world manufacturers, I worked with three or four of them at the CEO level, um, and that includes not only U.S. 
<laughs> I was close with the CEO of Toyota for uh, after almost 30 years. Uh, <clears throat> so I know a lot about what is going on in technology. <clears throat> you know, what was going on, but where, where it is going now, where the oil industry is going, where machinery is going, um, whether we're going to need ball bearings or something else. <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm convinced that we're moving into a period where we are returning to man-made materials, not stuff dug up from the earth, but stuff we create at MIT lab um, and material sciences lab. <clears throat> and uh, it's moving very fast. So you can't just go out and buy metals uh, indiscriminately, and that may be a real loser. So <clears throat> um, it, it requires thought. Agribusiness is definitely something to be in because people eat, no matter what. And, uh, and that business... It looks like it's disaggregated, but it isn't really. It's dominated by a small number of agribusiness firms and food processors, a small number of traders who dominate world, world movement. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to kind of step back and think, wait a minute, where is this all going? <laughs> and um, where will the manufacturing be? in 10 years, 20 years. Will it, be, will it come back to Detroit? Yeah, I don't think so. Maybe, it, maybe it'll show up in Tennessee or Alabama or Texas. It's coming in new places. <clears throat> and um, that's going to be disruptive. In Europe, it's not going to be in uh, Munich or Düsseldorf. It's going to be <clears throat> in Poland or in Romania, Bulgaria. Um, Morocco. Morocco is that far as Morocco, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. The the new industrial center of Germany is Morocco. Not very few people know that. I mean, they're making Germany is making even making automobiles in Morocco, not for Morocco, but but for world trade, world exports. <clears throat> There'll be some reshoring, you know, the big three German automakers. Uh, it's very strong in Alabama. They came there <clears throat> because they watched how Toyota over several years came from nothing to being a really big U.S. company making cars in the U.S. to the point where if you want to buy US, the highest U.S. content, you have no choice. You have to buy a Toyota. It's the important price. You can't match the, the U.S. content. Um, but the Germans have learned a lot from that. So they <clears throat> they are planning to increase production mostly in Alabama, and the market they're aiming at is not only the U.S. The market they're aiming at is Mexico, East Asia, China, Latin America, and broadly. I mean, they're they're looking at it as an export platform, but not with the heavy burden of German law and German unions. <clears throat> it's run away from unions, actually. But lots of change is coming. And uh, <clears throat> so when you start thinking through what do I want to be in? Um, do I want to be in mining in uh, Mongolia? Yeah, and maybe the stuff that's in the earth is not so valuable after all. So you have to be really careful. <clears throat> um, so th this is the way we're thinking. Where are we going? And where is industry going? <clears throat> and industry is so... Uh, I've been writing now... Actually, I started writing about this 30 years ago. I'm working with Toyota, watching everything, the, the robots, their automation systems. They were always ahead in the 
increasing productivity compared to the U.S. companies. <clears throat> and uh, so I started writing about the end of the uh, uh, production driven by location in places like <clears throat> Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or Pittsburgh, or Detroit. The uh, it, production can be anywhere. And uh, the scale would be changed by technology. This what we now have 3D printing and a lot of other manufacturing technologies. <clears throat> they, they use the new materials and they can do fantastic things, um, including making vehicles. Um, so all of this is mobile and uh, it's going to have huge implications, but it's going to affect real estate too. Uh, real estate in the northern U.S. is going to get beaten up some more because all the action is in southern U.S. And that's because all the new jobs, whether they're high tech or, uh, or basic industry, are in the southern states and the non union states. And that's, again, what's going on. Nobody likes to say that, but that's what it's about. Also, Mexico has been a huge beneficiary. Huge. Mexico huge. is now the biggest exporter to the U.S., having surpassed China. Canada is not far behind. In fact, I saw one chart that suggested Canada was now the equivalent of China. Uh -huh. So USMCA as well. So, um, But I think Mexico is the one that's a real beneficiary. Yeah. Really is the beneficiary. Let me ask you all this because, uh, yeah, the world is changing um, different, I suppose, like trade routes, um, reshoring and whatnot. Do you all think this means more persistent inflation? Do things get more expensive? Is it realistic to get back to a 2% inflation target? What are some of those kinds of implications? Deglobalization is by nature an inflationary concept. Um, <clears throat> We're not searching for the cheapest uh, cost of goods produced, which was always going to be China. Although, you know, to be honest with you, uh, there's going to be benefits for India. Vietnam's already quite capped out in terms of capacity, but India should be benefiting a lot. Uh, so it is by nature inflationary. Um, it just has to be. And I think... Is it realistic to still be aiming for two percent? Let me put it to you this way: If they were to, ch if the Fed or any of the central banks were to change their targets away from two percent before they hit it, given that they've already got a, a huge credibility issue from having deemed everything transitory uh, and having started raising rates too late, they're now possibly facing: Have they gone too far? and people are claiming that would also hurt their credibility. I'm not in that camp. I'm, I'm in the camp of if they pivot and start cutting and then have to raise rates again, that's the where the credibility is shattered. But they cannot, they just cannot up the inflation target before they've hit this, these targets. The big question is now, have they done enough? I suspect... I think Europe's done enough because of the trans, you know, the transmission mechanism being a lot shorter than um, than what you see in the U.S. Has the U.S. done enough? I'm just not sure. And also, the other problem with the U.S. is it, the economy is very financialized, so you tend to see some firing of employees when the stock market is down. So if you if you recall December. You had quite a few announcements from the tech industry. We're getting rid of 5,000 or 10,000. Uh, all these happened in January. And then come March, they started hiring again because the markets went up. Be interesting to see what happens at the moment. But um, so it's very financialized. So if we have a really bad stock market situation, then that could weigh on inflation because that will weigh on the economy. Uh, again, as I said, I don't think a stagflationary situation. My view is that you know rates have to still go higher, and I just, I don't worry. I don't think a stagflationary environment 
is necessary. Well, it's definitely not positive for, for rates. Rates will can, can easily continue higher because of unexpected, unexpectedly higher inflation in the weakening economy. Plus, you know, it all boils down to pro-cyclical fiscal policy in the end. Hal, over to you. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. I always look for reassurance from Hal. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to have me uh, have something positive to say about uh, Fed policy, but I can't. Um, I, I agree with you. <clears throat> if the economy is suffering, let's say, uh, equity market weakness and um, um, inadequate retail spending, um, you know, inventory start building again, they are not in a position to cut rates because they have to think about this fundamental fiscal imbalance. It's not going away. Um, and they 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 can't they simply cannot buy uh, this uh, proposal from uh, some Democrats. You know, let's lift the target to two and a half or three percent or maybe even four percent. The credibility, the keep credibility and get back on track. They're going to have to be severe in in the, let's say over the next two years. I don't see them making cuts. Anytime next year, I think we're talking about cuts maybe 2025, but that depends on who's president and what kind of fiscal policy we have. But think about it. where are we going to trim this fiscal monster? <clears throat> you're not going to do it in election year. No, you're not going to take anything away from anybody. But the following year, I mean, the great hunt. Where can we cut? federal bennies to everybody. And uh, it's going to be very interesting who they hit on, who, who's going to pay. <laughs> um, Actually, but, I, would, uh, I, would, I would add one other thing. And I, I am not a conspiracy theorist, but I, even though Jay Powell, when asked the question, do they take into account fiscal policy when setting monetary policy, said no. The Fed have historically done that. And it is yep. actually, should be one of the factors, the variables that the Fed considers. And I'm sitting here, I, I, I've got no evidence to prove it, but I, I have this suspicion that actually they are doing this. They are taking into account fiscal policy when setting monetary policy, uh, but they're not telling anybody. And that may be the one thing that the election year restricts them from doing is from admitting that that's what they're doing but um you know because it you know when i think it was two fomc meetings ago in the press conference jay powell said no 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 we don't because i don't want to you know i'm not answering questions on fiscal policy that's for the treasury that was a shocker to most people that remember the days where even greenspan never mind Volcker, greenspan used to discuss fiscal policy you know if it was too big Raising rates. He loved the Bill Clinton years because Congress cut it down to a balanced budget. And even a circus one year, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, a small yeah. purpose. Right. He loved that. That gave him room to cut rates. Um, so Greenspan was active, you know, and I, 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 well, Bernanke had other stuff to talk about. Uh, Yellen, what well, I think we're seeing Yellen's true colors as Treasury Secretary pretty progressive and a big spender loves the spending uh but but powell is a republican so um you know i suspect that's the uh i think there's something there i think that they're, they're watching fiscal and they're not watching it happily yeah i'm interrupting again. oh no I, <laughs> again there are no rules on the show and I have to say, like, I'm taking so many notes because I love listening to you both and I can listen to you both for hours. It's just such a treat. Again, I, I and I mean that. I do want to bring up, because um, we only have a few moments left and I don't know if y'all have a hard stop, but 
one of the things I know about your firm, um, you're mentioning, you know, the macro and the geopolitics and the politics and understand the implications on financial markets, but also a focus on risk management. And so I'll pose this question to both of you and how you can go first. What is that big risk for you today that maybe isn't getting enough attention paid to it? In terms of the, uh, <clears throat> if you're starting from the political side, what I already said is nobody's going to address the fiscal imbalance in the, in the run up to the election. But after that, <clears throat> there has to come a time of how do we stop the bleeding? And uh, <clears throat> so the, nobody's really thinking that far ahead. But I've, I've been sitting here with pen and pencil <clears throat> a number of thoughtful evenings. Where would I begin if our new president didn't say, hey, what do I do now? And I, th I think the easiest way <clears throat> to begin to cut the bleeding is to start trimming, not, not by saying you're announcing a heavy wealth tax, but taking away the, <clears throat> the uh, the tax benefits that come with uh, a lot of uh, um, our tax code taking away the drivers of wealth that seems to be going to corporate over everything else. I mean, stock buybacks didn't exist until Reagan. There was no stock buyback before that. So, so there's a question, why do we allow stock buybacks? I mean, it's a huge driver of wealth at the top, but there's no clear benefit to the rest of the economy. <laughs> and then the, uh, um, there's a whole bunch of these things. So the risk number one is Cuts and benefits are coming, but where, where are they going, who are they going to hit and when? And that should be part of uh, pension planning and uh, retirement planning. Uh, <clears throat> um, so then there is the question of uh, what's the future of, of all this international trade? Um, now, my view is that industrial trade is not going to bounce back. That basically, we're going to move less stuff in ships across oceans. We're going to do more and more production where, where users are. And, uh, <clears throat> and new technologies will allow that. Um, but I think the big shippers, by the way, see this coming. If you ask people at Maersk, you know, they're saying we, we're not going to need so many container ships. We're not going to need those routes we used to you know, use. It's, we're going to see shrinking uh, um, industrial led growth. You know, the, the years where manufacturing was the driver of growth, I think that's going to, that's going to die out. And uh, <clears throat> so, that's, that's not a small risk, that's a big risk. It means really thinking through <clears throat> key sectors of the economy. Are they on the rise or are they on the decline? Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, um, now the biggest risk of all is who we elect national leadership. I have no idea where this is going. And nobody does that else. I can only think, <clears throat> number one, Biden is getting old. I'm older than he is, but I'm more sharp, let's say, more agile. But to me, he he's going to have trouble getting close to the election. <clears throat> what, what do the Democrats have? Mm, they have one thing that nobody's thinking about. They have Obama who bought a residence, a mansion, in Washington, D.C. 
first president in more than a century who decided to stay in Washington. Every other president was told, please leave, thank you very much, and they went somewhere else. He stayed, he's there, his machinery is there. And <clears throat> if Biden falters, mm, he was going to think, I wonder if Michelle would run. And he probably would. He can beat anybody. For a lot of reasons. I've got a great, I've got a green lion here. This was something that tickled me no end. It was said to me by a friend of mine. <clears throat> Talking about Joe Biden and can he carry on, you know, from a health perspective and physically. And then this friend, I was having this discussion, this friend of mine said, he's the same age as Mick Jagger. <laughs> What do you think that, you know, when you compare, I mean, it's not apples and origins. Um, I mean, it's a sad thing, to, you know, he was a vibrant person, but it's, it, it, from my perspective as a non-American, and remember the UK has an election next year, but from my perspective, it, you know, it can only get better because you're starting off from the basis of Biden versus Trump. So it could only get better. Can I get any worse? No, because we're sitting there looking at Biden versus Trump. Uh, because I, you know, the odds def definitively favor Kamala Harris ha coming in over the next four years in, 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 if Biden wins. He's, you know, there's definitely, it's not getting better. Um, so I'm starting from the fact that, you know, presidential election, Biden versus Trump. What happens, what's interesting in Congress is it could be at one of those rare occasions where the Senate flips Republican and the House flips back Democrat because of some of the, the adjustments to the districts um, and, and what's coming up. Um, so I look at that and I, I, what I'm praying for is <clears throat> strong Congress, something that Congress has the ability to do a lot more than it has over the last, how long would you say, Hal? 30 yeah, years? Yeah, Congress has been weakening in the last 20 years. Yeah, the last 20 years. In, the days, in you know, part of my career, I worked with the Senate directly. And in those days, we had really powerful senators um, in both parties. And I was nonpartisan. I was able to work with both. I was a trusted intermediary, quietly operating, um, generating consensus where nobody thought anything could happen. Um, but that's just missing now. But that will get rebuilt at some point. Yeah. And uh, there has to be a counterweight to um, this over-centralized presidency uh, that hangs on individual characteristics. Likewise in the rest of the world, you know, my hope is, and this sounds like a slightly perverse hope, the seriousness of the situation with Xi Jinping and Putin for forces a broadening of a power structure in each of the major countries, such that you get good people coming through. Not necessary as leader, but within a consensus of leadership, and that those good people transmit themselves. I think you know, perhaps the perhaps the U.S. and the U.K. are going to be closest because this election cycle could well be the last of the election cycles before we get to that point. Europe probably has to go through a bit more pain. I mean, Europe, continental Europe, it's definitively going quite to the right and populist. Now, the irony is one of the, she's defined as a hard right populist, Meloni in Italy has been an incredibly effective leader uh, and talks to the people and discusses things in a logical manner. We need more of that, but, you know, that, and that's where I get optimistic. I think that comes around. It just, I'm not sure how long it takes in various election cycles. So I am an optimist, um, thankfully. 
Uh, otherwise, it would just be unbearable. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask one quick question for you both, because um, how uh, for the folks who are watching and listening, you were an aide in four administrations, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. Um, and I know you've advised over the years. And for folks, um, Nick was a PM at one of the top macro hedge funds in the world. Um, you mentioned Alan Howard, Brevin Howard earlier, and you both together yeah. just- I was also Salomon Brothers. Salomon Brothers as well. No yes, a lot of folks made their <laughs> careers there. Um, and I'm just, I wanna ask because I'm a millennial and I just love learning from different generations. What message would you send my generation or even younger generations? Uh. <laughs> I have to do for my children. Um, yeah, I, I have I have younger children too. I have um, two batches of children. Uh, Pippa, my oldest, you know, um, she's um, around sixty now. I have uh, three young ones that are in their twenties. Um, <clears throat> it's quite a big range, and. Uh, the, um, everybody's wrapped up in the here and now, you know, what's the immediate uh, comfort zone, uh, a little bit desperate because they're not making it without help from mom and dad, a little worried because all their university training is not turning out to generate high paying jobs. <clears throat> it's time, uh, one way or another, for that whole generation, that set of generations, to um, rethink living style, um, ambition, and I would hope out of that, some of some of these people will be going to public service, one way or another, uh, and and um, the. Um, the um, and and learn to be adaptable. The the new jobs are very different from jobs that thirty years ago, sitting at a desk with a with a specific task. Most jobs now are here's our problem. See if you can fix this part of it. And by the way, you have any idea about what's going on down the hall? Fix that too. It's it's adaptability. It's uh, teamwork. And I guess this idea that teamwork is coming back to be central to everything. Um, individualism is not really helpful, but you need is a lot more cooperation, a lot more teamwork, uh, combined efforts of people. And uh, we lost all that. We, when we come out of World War II, had a lot of people who were in the army or in the military learn hierarchy, learn structure, learn covering each other's backs, protecting each other. They be, they became great builders of industry. We you know we had a training school you didn't want a war, but from it we had a whole new series of decades of growth. Because people thought that way. How do we work together? But it's slowly dying out now. It, it's got to come back. And, I couldn't uh, agree more. The, the most effective working practice is team, teamwork. But I also, to add to what Hal was saying, is keep learning the lessons of history. Don't get any... And, and what, I, what I mean by that is, or, or, and, and this is not... I'm not being anti woke or anything of that nature, but go to the original history. Not, you know, a lot of these, what's being rewritten, it's been shocking me. There are lessons to be learned, good and bad. Be prepared to be shocked, because that's how you learn the lessons. Um, so, you know, and, and the whole point of teamwork is you're not going to get on with everybody. You don't need any safe, safe spaces to avoid not getting on with the people you don't get on with. That's the way it is. So, um, you know, I, I, I agree with how strongly teamwork and also, you know, really learn the lessons of history. There's so much to, I mean, you know, if you look at uh, 
what we've been talking about now, fiscal, this pro-cyclical fiscal policy, guns and buttons, LBJ, Vietnam War, Great Society. What have we got now? We're still paying for COVID, equivalent of a war. We've got Bidenomics, whereas we had Trumponomics beforehand. It's the same thing. It's all over again, just different names. So um, the lessons of history, and, and where that's critical is, what did they do about it? It took until we got to that 19, until we got to Clinton and that the Congress that he was working with there. That's why I hope Congress and the checks and balances come back in force. So, you know, as a non-American, I think it's important for the rest of the world as well. I, I also heard from like my, my grandfather, I, I heard this from my mom that, um, I guess it would be his generation. He did, he wasn't a senator, or congressman, or anything. He did work in D.C. That um, Democrats and Republicans used to get lunch together, and they used to get beach houses together. And I wonder if we'll ever get back to that in society. Yeah. <clears throat> well, wow. I'm gonna. You know, I think I was um, sort of snatched out of academia by Jack Kennedy's people. Came to Washington and dropped in the middle of politics. I was a whole different world. I was an academic through and through. Suddenly, I'm in the middle of all that. Well, somehow I was a duck from found water. I had a ball. I really enjoyed myself in politics. And I learned about political humor across the parties. And I remember, for personal reasons, I had three young daughters and they needed my attention. So I announced I was leaving the government um, in the 79. <clears throat> and um, then Nixon brought me back to the White House, chased out Holderman and Ehrlichman, met with me alone, made Holderman really nervous. <clears throat> and he said, you know, they're standing out in the hallway, they want to know. Uh, uh, I said, what do they want to know? He said, well, are you one of us? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I got to tell them, are you a Republican or, or a Democrat? I said, yes. He said, what does that mean? I said, I'm a problem solver. I work for both. I don't really care. The nation has a problem. Tell me what it is. I'll show up a solution. But it will take working with both sides. Openly or secretly? He said, damn, I wish I hadn't even heard him before now. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, but it was very interesting. I'll, uh, I'll tell you a secret I haven't yet written about okay. anywhere. But I had gotten to know one of his most important campaign, campaign managers from California all the way to Washington. Been with him 30 years. <clears throat> and, and I liked that guy. So... Nixon said to me, by the way, I know you, you, you're friends with Murray. And I said, yes. He said, here's the deal. You tell Murray anything you need from me, and I'll get you an answer back in 10 minutes. But don't tell anybody else, because it will become a partisan fight. So, but nobody can override the president. So you tell me what you need. And the next day you go to a meeting saying, the president informs me that. And nobody will know how you get that power or how you even got to me. And let's keep it that way. Let's have fun together. <clears throat> it was all about bipartisanship. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to say, gentlemen, I have loved having you both on. Um, do you all want to share where folks can read your research? Or I think you all have a Shopify store and where they can follow you all on social. You want to take a minute to share? Sure. We have a Shopify store under the uh, Mountain Green Glinsman Partners. Um, <clears throat> typically, the two of us tweet out, we do a daily macro markets commentary, and we also do a daily political and geopolitical commentary. Uh, and we typically tweet out a highlight from each every day with the address of the respective Shopify link for each of them. So uh, my Twitter handle is at, at nglinsman, um, and Howells is at Howells Rethink, all one word. Um, and uh, we're probably going to do a, 
a store Twitter handle. I've just got to figure out how best to get that sorted out because I'm not a huge fan of social media and, uh, you know, working all over the place. Um, but also, you know, if, if you're having trouble and you want to have, you know, subscribe or whatever, <clears throat> and you're having trouble with the links, just get in touch with us um, uh, via Twitter direct message, or you can get in touch with me directly at Nick, N I C K, at evocapital.com. And why is my email different from Mount Gregorians and Partners? Because I still have access to uh, a lot of research which requires that email. And I'm still, uh, we still advise some, uh, some fund managers, so it keep, we keep it out there. So I'm not doing anything wrong, it's all good. <laughs> well, we're, we're doing institutional research now, too. So um, um, that kind of work is a little deeper. Um, and it goes through the heart of trading uh, for those, you know, the hedge funds. And also, we're getting inquiries now from pension funds. What do we do now? How, how, do, we, how do we reorganize? Um, you know, how do we reset portfolios? I mean, that's, but that, I'm hopeful that, that it's, everybody's waking up saying, oh my God, um, we need to redo allocations. So I think we'll be busy. The institutional stuff is more serious, uh, more in depth. Let me add one thing that the stuff that we do on a daily basis, it, what we have, the, 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 the pricing level we have on Shopify is for individual private investors and smaller in smaller family offices. We charge a lot more um, for uh, institutions for the same work and, and obviously conversations, special special stuff. Got it. Well, Harold Malmgren and Nicholas Glensman, partners and co-founders of Malmgren Glensman Partners, it has been an absolute pleasure and treat having you both on. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your knowledge and your ideas. I really appreciate both of you. Thank you again. Pleasure, Julia. Thank you. It's been fun being with you. Um, it's a pleasure. So much fun.